Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. So, after six years of war, this great venture of the Hellenes came to nothing. Out of the whole great force, a few managed to make their way through Libya and find safety in Cyrene. But nearly all were destroyed. Thucydides. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 60, Disaster on the Nile. So, the last few episodes, we had seen our focus shift back to the mainland of Greece, looking at the developments that were taking place there. This had seen the operations of the Delian League in the Aegean begin to have a greater effect on policies that were developing between both Athens and Sparta. As Greece moved into the 460s, the suspicion and hostility that existed between the two began to come to the surface. This was first seen in Sparta's secret agreement to attack Attica while Athens was engaged in a siege on Thassos. Though Poseidon had stepped in and shook the Peloponnese with a mighty earthquake, with it appearing Sparta had been the epicenter. This had caused a crisis for Sparta, with a helot revolt also breaking out, and their plans of an invasion into Attica was never realised. These desperate times would call for desperate measures, seeing Sparta call upon its allies in the Peloponnesian and Hellenic leagues. This also seeing them reach out to Athens. Though this would be a complex time of internal factions competing for influence within both these cities. These dynamics would see what appears to be odd changes and decisions taking place. Not long after arriving in Sparta, Athens would be told their services were no longer required, with Spartan suspicion seeming to reign supreme. Relations between these two old Hellenic League allies would descend even further. This then saw us focus on the period that would be described as the First Peloponnesian War. Athens and Sparta would begin to manoeuvre on the mainland to react to the open hostility that now existed between them. This would see the geopolitical situation change around them as new alliances would form and conflicts would erupt. Sparta had managed to stay out of the fighting for the first three years, but would eventually react to Athens campaigning. This would lead to the first engagement between the two on the battlefield for the 5th century at a place called Tanagra, in the region of Boeotia. Although not all sources agree on the outcome, it is more commonly seen as a Spartan victory, but it was by no means a crushing defeat for Athens. This is where we left events in Greece, though we will be picking up the aftermath of Tanagra and what would follow in the next episode. For today's episode, I want to rewind a little back to the start of the period we focused on last episode, beginning around 460. As there were more than just the campaigns within Greece taking place, Athens would also still be engaged in campaigns further afield with the Delian League. This will see us looking at the Delian League's involvement back in Cyprus, where they had campaigned some 18 years earlier. But a great deal of our focus will be on a campaign of opportunity that would develop, seeing the League make for the Nile and into Egyptian lands. Revolt had once again broken out within the Persian Empire, with Egypt trying its luck once again. The Libyan king leading the revolt would seek Athenian assistance, seeing the Delian League enter into a conflict on the side of the rebels. It would appear this campaign would stretch on for some six years, but Athens would not see the same successes they had in the previous campaigns against the Persian Empire. But before we get into these events, we're going to begin by checking back in with the events around the Persian Empire, as a quite important development would take place. It is also thought to help explain why Egypt revolted in the first place. This would be the assassination of Xerxes and the accession of his son Artaxerxes. Last time we looked into what was happening in the Persian Empire was back when we did our episode on the Battle of the Eurymedon. Here we saw that Xerxes was still the king of the empire and had turned to other possible campaigns within his lands. It also seemed that efforts had been made to try and stabilise the western parts of the empire once the Greeks began campaigning in Persian territory. Though, with the information that we do have, it is difficult to know exactly what was going on. However, we did see that there was extensive building projects taking place at a few of the palace sites, indicating the empire was still flourishing. We then wrapped up our look into the happenings within the Persian Empire 
with what appeared to be a possible Persian build-up of forces that were directed for another effort against Greece. This then saw us cover the events around the Battle of the Eurymedon, the largest battle between Greek and Persian forces since the Greco-Persian War. We saw that the dates often given for the Battle of the Eurymedon were either 469 or 466, and from here we saw the Delian League had moved onto campaigns back closer to Greece. Though inside the Persian Empire a dramatic change was about to occur within the royal court, this bringing Xerxes' nearly 21 year reign to an end. This isn't the first time we see what appears to be court intrigue causing the downfall of a Persian king. We had seen the same occur with Cambyses, the son of Cyrus the Great and founder of the empire. Like with Cambyses' assassination, trying to get a clear account of Xerxes' assassination is going to be very difficult. For the most part, we have to rely heavily on Greek sources, with Diodorus, Cetius, Justin and Thucydides providing the majority of what has come down to us today. Though we do have one piece of evidence from within the Persian Empire that at least helps us arrive at an actual date that his assassination took place, providing what it records is the correct information. This was in the form of a tablet that was uncovered at Babylon that states within it, On the fourteenth day of Abu, Xerxes' son killed him. When attempting to align this date with our own calendar, a reading of late July, early August, 465 BC is arrived at. This seeing his assassination occurring around the same time that Athens was laying siege to Thassos. However, for the reported details of events, we need to turn to our Greek sources, though this isn't to say that what they record is fact. Most of these sources relate that the assassination would occur due to a conspiracy headed by Artabanus, one of Xerxes' bodyguards. The motivation of why this plot would be hatched in the first place is not given to us, apart from the generic and stereotypical view that it was due to the disastrous Greek campaigns which the historian Justin reports. Though as we have seen in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't seem to have affected the empire. Plus the Persian invasions into Greece were over 15 years in the past. As we run through the general outline of what occurred, just keep in mind the details that the Babylonian tablet tells us, Xerxes' son killed him. We know that Xerxes had at least three legitimate sons, with it most commonly thought that Darius was the eldest, therefore heir to the throne, Hardaspes, and often cited as Xerxes' third son, Artaxerxes. We then hear that Artabanus, Xerxes' bodyguard who had designs on power, would have Xerxes killed, with help from other court officials. In the case of Diodorus, this would be Xerxes' chamberlain. It then appears he then looked to ensuring there would be no heirs left to take the throne. Diodorus would write, Artabanus, being led at night by Mithridates into the king's bedchamber, slew Xerxes, and then set out after the king's sons. He would convince Artaxerxes that his older brother, Darius, had been responsible for the assassination of their father, so he could take the throne. Artaxerxes would then have Darius killed for committing this heinous crime against their father, while also ensuring he would not become a mere slave with this illegal transfer of power. Diodorus would then continue to describe events, seeing Artabanus deciding to now do away with Artaxerxes, since he was isolated at court. Supposedly the other brother, Hardaspes, was in Bactria as satrap, another important element when we try to understand other angles around what was happening. Anyway, Diodorus presents a dramatic scene that would show Artaxerxes that all was not as it seemed. When Artabanus saw how his plan was prospering, he called his own sons to his side, and crying out that now was his time to win the kingship, he strikes Artaxerxes with his sword. Artaxerxes, being wounded merely and not seriously hurt by the blow, held off Artabanus and dealing him a fatal blow, killed him. Though there are a number of other accounts that unfold differently around the death of Artabanus, from he himself and his plot being betrayed to Artaxerxes, with this occurring in a couple of different ways, we also find that he would meet his end through being executed and another version seeing the army come to Artaxerxes' rescue. This would then see Artaxerxes take over the Persian Empire, supposedly seeing the crisis of the Achaemenid dynasty being averted. However, the stories recorded by the Greeks do not address the one glaring missing point from the Babylonian tablet, Xerxes being killed by one of his sons. This had led many to turn to the assumption that what we have just gone over were tales told within Persia that the Greeks got a hold of and were designed to cover up what really occurred. Obviously, many then turned to who had gained the most from Xerxes' death, his son Artaxerxes. Though with the details that do survive, it is almost impossible for us to arrive at an accepted truth 
or that can be put forward are theories. This would now see a new king on the throne of the Persian Empire, Artaxerxes I. As with many transfers in power, and like what we have seen in Persian history, these periods are usually followed by others seeing an opportunity to gain their own power or freedom before the new royal figure has been able to consolidate their power and influence in their new position. This will see us transfer into a revolt that sees us heading back to actions of the Athenians and Delian League. But first, I want to quickly address another point that has not properly been explained in the sources around a different revolt further east. This has to do with Hydaspes, the other surviving son of Xerxes. Now, it is often thought that he was the second oldest after Darius, as it was common for the second born son to be given the satrapy of an important region as compensation, since they missed out on being in line for the throne. So with Xerxes and then Darius's death, one wonders why Hydaspes had not taken the throne. What appears in the sources raises more questions over Artaxerxes' involvement in the whole affair. We hear that the region of Bactria would revolt with Artaxerxes coming to the throne, this being the region that Hydaspes was administering. Though to confuse matters, different writers refer to different people leading this revolt. Though if Hydaspes was still in fact satrap, it could show that he was far from pleased with his younger brother taking power, whether he had usurped the throne or not. But we would hear that Artaxerxes would respond to the revolt, eventually defeating it and bringing the region back under Persian control. Artaxerxes would then be able to convince the vast majority of his legitimacy to the throne and empire, continuing the Achaemenid dynasty. However, there was another very important region that would now see the time being right to attempt to break away from Persian rule. This would be the region of Egypt, and we would hear far more about this revolt due to the Greeks becoming involved in matters. Through our Greek sources, particularly Diodorus, we hear that Xerxes' assassination and the confusion surrounding it would be the reason revolt would break out in Egypt. An army had been mustered to support the bid for freedom from Persian control. One of the first actions of the rebels was to evict the Persian administrative system that saw tribute from Egyptian lands making it into the Persian coffers. The man who would lead the revolt was a Libyan named Anaris, and he would see that the forces already assembled would be bolstered through further recruitment in Egyptian lands as the revolt spread. Mercenaries from surrounding lands would also come to support the rebels in their efforts seeing a considerable army amassed. Anaris, now having much of Egypt in revolt, and at the head of a substantial army, he now sought to gain support from powers further afield, as he recognised he would still need larger forces to challenge the Persian army. This would see him send an embassy to Athens, who had directed a number of campaigns against the Persians in previous years. The last campaign in the Aegean that we saw the Athenians engaging in with their Delian League was the Siege of Thassos. This then saw the focus within our ancient sources head back to developments taking place on the Greek mainland. This then saw everything around the developing conflict between Athens and Sparta taking the limelight. However, it becomes apparent that the League was operating further out in the Mediterranean after their victory on Thassos. For when it comes to the Egyptian campaign being introduced, we would hear that the Delian League was currently engaged on Cyprus. However, we would not hear about any of the details around the reasons or lead up to the campaign that would develop there. In the past, we have seen that Cyprus was of great strategic importance to both the Persian Empire and the Greeks. Perhaps all we can assume with the lack of details is that the Delian League was looking to attempt to exert their influence back into the island. The last we heard of Cyprus was during the Battle of the Eurymedon, where a reinforcement of ships for the Persians set sail from. This would indicate that the island was under Persian control, and after the Greek victory in this battle, and their relatively quick departure from the theatre, it had remained the case. So it would be while the Athenians were involved in operations on Cyprus that Anaris' delegation would arrive in Athens. Now I think we need to just take a moment to talk about the dates around the Egyptian revolt and Athens' involvement. It is assumed that if the revolt was the result of Xerxes' assassination and the turmoil that followed it, it would seem it developed during 464 or 463. However, Athens wouldn't be approached for assistance or they wouldn't at least get involved until 459 or 460. The inscription of the Athenian war dead that we spoke of last episode includes a number of campaigns, Egypt being one, while this inscription covered those who died in 459 and 460. These dates would be for the most part the most accepted when it comes to the revolt in Egypt and Athens involvement, though we do need to acknowledge that they are not certain and some do question them. This is particularly the case with Athens involvement. The argument being 
that it seemed strange that Athens would begin a large campaign across the Mediterranean while the conflict with Sparta was heating up. But with that said, let's continue on with the developments. So with the rebels' embassy in Athens, they would attempt to convince the Athenians in supporting their bid for freedom. Obviously, they would have framed their argument to show how Athens would benefit for their service. Diodorus would give us a few lines on what was supposedly promised. If they should liberate the Egyptians, he would give them a share in the kingdom and grant them favours many times greater than the good service they had rendered. Unfortunately, we don't hear about the decisions behind the scene and what would ultimately lead to the Athenians voting to send an expedition to Egypt. We would just be told that they decided it was to their advantage to defeat the Persians in Egypt and become close to the Egyptians. In hindsight, this decision would turn out to be disastrous and described as reckless. This would see arguments made to try and find who was responsible for this policy. The arguments would basically take two lines, one looking to blame Pericles, the other looking to distance him. I'm not going to get into these debates as it will occupy the rest of the episode. I just want to point out my observations on the situation, just remembering that we have no details from behind the scenes. On a general perspective, the factions that had been competing for influence in Athens had both been in support of operations of the Delian League in the Aegean. The main point of contention had been with Athens' policy towards Sparta on the mainland. I think popular support in Athens would have been behind further operations against the Persians, given their previous successes and given the opportunity that now lay before them. It seems even greater rewards could be had. If there had been opposition to the expedition, we don't know. Though if there had been those hesitant, I think popular support would have made it dangerous for that particular faction to follow through in this time where the FELT and Periclean led faction had yet consolidated itself. The more aggressive policy towards Sparta may have raised concerns in an overseas venture, though there were already 200 ships engaged at Cyprus. Though perhaps with the previous successes and confidence built up, the risk was seen to be worth it. Remember here, we are viewing the decisions taken and the events in Egypt and the mainland in hindsight. Have you been enjoying the series and thinking of helping support the show in some way? Casting Through Ancient Greece is over on Patreon, where we have been providing supporters with monthly bonus episodes where we look at past topics in more detail in isolation. So far we have revisited the Bronze Age of Greece, looking at art, trade connections, warfare, and a number of other topics. We then advanced into the Archaic Period, where we then spent some time exploring the little known Lalatine War, the Olympic Games, Emergence of the Hoplite, and other areas. This then saw us turn into do a three-part series on the epic poet Homer, where we also explore the two epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, that are credited to him. Currently, we are exploring the development of both Sparta and Athens in more detail. We have recently dealt with the origin myths of both of these city-states. We are now about to look a little deeper into the influential figures from both Athens and Sparta in their early histories. We will be first looking at Lycurgus, the lawgiver of Sparta, before we then move on to Solon of Athens. If you are interested in gaining access to these bonus episodes, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Not only will you get monthly bonus episodes, but you will receive early access, ad-free episodes, plus video series updates about what's happening in the series, what's planned, and we also run competitions. Other options also include access to fully referenced transcripts of the series episodes, as well as a forum where members' questions are answered every month via video. Alternatively, you can visit the Casting Through Ancient Greece website where you can find the Patreon link, as well as other ways that help the series grow when clicking on the Support the Series button. Thank you all for listening to the series, and I look forward to perhaps seeing you over on Patreon. So with this decision for an expedition to support the revolt taking place in Egypt, Athens would send 200 ships according to Thucydides, while Diodorus would say 300, although he would later say there were 200 committed. As we have said, Athens and the Delian League were already engaged in Cyprus, and it would be these forces here that would be diverted to Egypt, seeing that already deployed forces would be utilised rather than sending yet more men and ships out of Athens. This point, I think, also might go into some way in mitigating the risk of an overseas campaign while things were heating up within Greece. News of the revolt breaking out travelled back to Artaxerxes, who after realising the forces currently in Egypt were insufficient to deal with it, began making arrangements for an army to be sent to restore Persian control. We hear that he would recruit contingents of men from many satraps in an effort to raise an army that would outnumber the rebels. Artaxerxes placed in command of this army his uncle Archimenes, 
who had been satrap in Egypt during the reign of Xerxes and appears to have still been when the revolt broke out. Diodorus would tell us that a force of 300,000 would be assembled, but we should know by now that the figures we are too often given are severely inflated. The Persian forces would then march into Egypt where they would make their base at the Nile. Here time was needed to rest the army and arrange it so it could begin operations against the rebels. While the Persian movements were taking place, the Greek fleet would arrive in Egypt where they would sail up the Nile and rendezvous with Anaris and his forces. This now saw both armies in the same region and then making preparations to meet in battle. This would be the first battle in the Egyptian campaign that would be fought, though both sources that are usually relied upon give us no clue as to where it was fought, and thereby to what to call this battle. It is Herodotus who helps us out here, with him speaking of the battle in passing when writing of events to do with Cambyses' Egyptian campaign in 525 BC. He was describing what he saw in Egypt where a battle between Cambyses' forces and the Egyptians took place. The bones of those slain on either side in this fight lay scattered separately, for the Persian bones lay in one place and the Egyptians in another, where the armies had first separately stood. After giving further details on the bones of both sides, he would then continue. I saw too the skulls of those Persians at Proprimus, who were slain with Darius' son, Archimenes, by Inaris the Libyan, and they were like the others. So with Herodotus aside, we know that the battle that Diodorus speaks of as being the Battle of Proprimus. Once the battle was joined, it would be hard fought, but Diodorus would say that for a time, the Persians with their superior numbers maintained the advantage. Though somehow the Athenians were able to take the offensive and see the tide of battle turn against the Persians. This would eventually see the Persian force break that was opposing the Athenians, with it then looking like this localised flight of troops became infectious seeing the rest of the Persian army rout en masse. As we have spoken about before, this is where the true slaughter of land battles would take place, and Diodorus highlights this. Though, with most battles, even in a rout, there would be those who would manage to escape the carnage. We would then hear that the survivors of the battle would retreat out of the Nile Delta, further up the Nile to Memphis, where they would take refuge in the citadel there, known as the White Fortress or White Wall. This would see the rebels now in control of most of the Nile Delta. However, this would not be the end of the campaign. The Athenians would follow up their victory in the battle, pursuing the defeated Persians back to Memphis. Though being behind these defensive walls, they would not be able to re-engage with the enemy. This would now see the siege of Memphis develop. News of the defeat in Egypt at the hands of the rebels and the Athenians made it back to Artaxerxes, along with his uncle's body, who had been slain during the fighting. Artaxerxes now turned to attempt a different approach in defeating the revolt, where he would look to try and break up the enemy's strength without fighting. This would see Persian gold being used in an attempt to have the Greeks fight each other to suit Persian interests. This would be a common strategy followed in the future as the Peloponnesian War unfolded. Artaxerxes assembled a delegation headed by Megabazos with the task of convincing the Spartans with gold to invade Attic territory. The aim of this was to attempt to create a crisis in Athenian home territory, which would hopefully see them recall their forces from Egypt. This would then see the rebels have to face the Persians without any outside help. Unfortunately for Artaxerxes, the negotiations were unsuccessful and the delegation was recalled back to the empire, though apparently having spent much of the gold in their attempt at convincing the Spartans. This attempt at buying the Spartans appears to be around the same point they remained inactive while Athens was campaigning on the mainland. We had looked to possible reasons for this, which may have also had a bearing on their refusal of the Persian proposal. Their situation with the Helots may have prevented the thought of any action outside the Peloponnese. The state of Spartan politics may have seen opposition in being actively involved in Attica, or perhaps they were already developing a plan in conjunction with the Thebans, as we explored a little last time. So, with other means explored, to try and break the Athenians' will to fight failing, Artaxerxes now turned to recruiting another army to send to Egypt. This time the forces would be led by another Megabazos, not the one sent on the delegation, but this one was the son of the satrap of Babylonia. It appears much more planning went into this attempt at putting down the revolt, as the army would be marched to Cilicia and Phoenicia on the way to Egypt, where they would remain for the next year. While here, a vast navy was assembled, comprising of both transport and fighting ships. The land army, while in the region, was also subjected to training 
to better prepare them for the coming campaign. While much care was taken to see that the Persian forces would be entering into Egypt with the latest and most effective weapons. Meanwhile, the siege on the White Fortress at Memphis was continuing, with the Persian defence effective enough in seeing the rebels and Athenians failing to take it. Once Megabazos' forces were ready, they now began their march to Egypt, leaving Phoenicia and marching through Syria, while the fleet sailed along the coast towards the Nile. It appears that this force was much better prepared and perhaps larger than the original one that was sent in. As they marched into Memphis, we would hear that their initial contact with the besiegers would see the siege of the White Fortress broken. We don't get any details of the battle that took place, but Diodorus would say, At the outset, they broke the siege of the White Fortress, having struck the Egyptians and Athenians with terror. This would indicate that the Egyptians and Athenians may have been surprised by the appearance of the Persian force, or perhaps surprised by the numbers and the quality of the troops they engaged this time around. However, after this initial victory, the Persian force would not risk another frontal assault on the enemy, giving some weight to the theory the rebels were not prepared for the initial showing of the Persians. With the siege broken up, the Athenians would fall back into the Nile Delta, to where their ships were moored. This was a place called Prosopitis, effectively an island in the Delta. Though they would not be able to board their ships and leave, the Persian forces had followed up the retreating Athenians and laid siege to the island, preventing their escape. At this stage, it is hard to know what had happened to the Egyptians, but it seems likely that they were attempting to hold out after this defeat, given what we will learn in a minute. We would continue to see that Megabazos was unwilling to risk a stand-up battle with the Athenians. He would have probably engaged in talks to try and get the Athenians to surrender, though it appears they were looking to hold their ground since the water barrier between them and the Persians posed a good defensive position. Instead of battle, he then turned to a strategy to try and convince the Athenians that surrender was their best option. He had his men now engage in labour, where they would divert the many canals around the island. This would see the water surrounding the island flow into other waterways in the delta, where eventually the Athenian ships would end up resting on land rather than water. The negotiations of the works carried out would see that the siege around the island would carry on for some 18 months. This now saw the Athenians in a position where they faced the Persian forces without any defensive advantage. Like I have said, it is unclear where the Egyptian forces were. Some may have been on the island with the Athenians, though they would have probably been in other areas of the Nile Delta also. Anaris would end up learning of the Athenians' predicament, and seeing his strongest allies now in this position, he saw that the revolt had run its course. In an attempt to gain some sort of favourable terms for the rebels, he now came to terms with Megabazos. With the Persians no longer having to focus on the rebels throughout the Delta, they would now be able to bring more forces into focus on the isolated Athenians. It would be here that we get conflicting reports on what would take place next. Diodorus would tell us that the Athenians would resolve to still stand their ground and fight. Megabazos seeing this still was unwilling to risk a frontal battle and would instead come to a truce with the Athenians. The terms would allow them to make their way out of Egypt unhindered, where they would head west into Libya and to Cyrene, where they would then get back to Athens safely. However, Thucydides would have a far less optimistic account. It is also worth noting that most tend to follow what Thucydides recounts here, as he was an Athenian and these events were still in the living memory of Athens at the time he was writing. He would tell us that the Persian forces would now advance onto the Athenian position over land. Perhaps Megabazus' forces around the island had been swelled with Anaris' surrender and was in a more confident position to engage. We're not sure how the battle unfolded, we would just be told. The ships were thus left high and dry. Most of the island was connected to the mainland and he captured it by marching across it on foot. Though it is clear that the Athenians suffered a terrible fate, Thucydides continues. So after six years of war, this great venture of the Hellenes came to nothing. Out of the whole great force, a few managed to make their way through Libya and find safety in Cyrene, but nearly all were destroyed. This would be the point we are told where the lands of Egypt would pass back into Persian control. However, this would not be the extent of the disaster suffered by the Athenians. There would be one last episode of their disaster on the Nile. It would seem that while the Athenians were besieged on the island, they had managed to get a message back to Athens. They had sought help in relieving their position and breaking the siege. In Athens, it had been decided to send an additional 50 triremes made up from the Athenian fleet as well as other Delian League members. By this stage, it would have been around 455 or 454 BC. 
two or so years after the Battle of Tanagra and the series of conflicts that were engaged in within Greece, which had seen their manpower stretch thin. Although they would still engage in further conflicts after Tanagra, which we'll look at next episode, they were in a better position to send yet more men away. Plus, receiving news of the plight their forces were in would have been motivation to rescue them and save a good proportion of the Athenian fighting strength. As we saw, the siege would stretch out for 18 months, and we are unsure when Athens received the call for help. But what we do here is that by the time the additional 50 triremes had reached the Nile, the besieged forces had already been destroyed. Unfortunately for the rescue force, they were completely in the dark on what had transpired within the Nile Delta. Their first stop on reaching Egypt was at the Mendesian mouth of the Nile, and it would be here that they would start to get the picture that all was not well on the Nile. They would come under attack from the Persians on land, while the Persian fleet made up of Phoenician ships would engage them on the water. We had seen a number of times in the past the Greeks were able to get the better of the Persian land and sea forces, even when outnumbered. But here, it would be the Persians that were victorious, destroying much of this Greek relief force, with only a few being able to escape. This final chapter in the Egyptian venture would see that this disaster in the Nile would be further exacerbated. For Athens and the rest of their allies of the Delian League, this outcome would have come as a great shock. It would be the first time in generations where they would suffer a loss this great. Their past successes over the years against the Persians would have also made this a very bitter pill to swallow. To round out this episode today, we will look at the aftermath of the Egyptian adventure where we can perhaps put into perspective the magnitude of the disaster for Athens, as well as some of the fallout on the Persian side after their victory. When it comes to the consequences for Athens, we will be seeing this at work in more detail as we continue with the next few episodes. First, let's start with the victors. We had seen that Onaris had negotiated a surrender with Megabazos, though another king, Amaratus, known as the King of the Marshes, had not been part of this agreement, though he had joined in the revolt when it had broken out. He appears to have continued his resistance against Persian rule, though it was not nearly on the same scale as what had just been defeated. His influence appears to have been confined to a small area within the Western Nile Delta. That was pretty inhospitable and tough to campaign in. For this reason, it appears Persia was quite willing to leave him be, since it would have had very little impact on the Persian control in Egypt. However, it would be in the same region some 50 years later that a successful revolt would take place seeing another king also named Emiratus becoming pharaoh of Egypt, though this would be short-lived. We also get some more information surrounding Anaris after his surrender through Cetius, the Greek physician who resided in the Persian court in the late 5th and early 4th century. His account provides us a little more court intrigue, though it is important to note what he tells us is not reported in any other source, so making it difficult to know how credible it is. Cetius would tell us, through a surviving fragment, that the terms Megabazos had negotiated with Anaris would be undermined by Artaxerxes. It would seem that Anaris had surrendered with the understanding his life would be spared. However, orders had arrived from Artaxerxes that he be put to death, which was carried out. On the point of Anaris's fate, Thucydides tells us that he was betrayed to the Persians and subsequently crucified, this giving us the impression he had gone into hiding after the surrender, fearing for his own life after having led a major revolt against Persia. This fear seems to make some sense, as we have seen Persian rulers, although showing restraint with revolting populations in the past, could also be quite ruthless in setting an example for others, especially if the rebellion was protracted or would cause signs of weakness within the Persian court. Artaxerxes, only just having come to the throne, and the revolt breaking out due to this, was probably under pressure to set an example to other would-be rebels in this early stage of his reign. Anyway, back to Cetius' story. Apparently, this interference in Megabazos' terms caused him great resentment towards Xerxes. Cetius presents Megabazos as a noble figure. Artaxerxes' decision would have seen an important promise being made broken, damaging Megabazos' credibility. This would supposedly lead him moving out of Egypt into Syria, where he would then in turn rebel against his king. He would defeat two armies sent against him, and only after extensive negotiations would he come to terms and be welcomed back into court. Again, it is hard to know how accurate this is, but some have turned to the books of Nehemiah and Ezra in the Bible to show revolts had broken out in this region. However, this argument is also debated, with depending how these are interpreted, it could be referring to a period under the rule of Artaxerxes II. 
For Athens, the disaster in Egypt was like nothing they had experienced before. In terms of manpower and ships, the losses were significant. If we take the Citadel's account, 200 ships were committed and lost with a further 50 destroyed. This would also see some 50,000 men lost in the campaign. Given that we know that there were 170 rowers per trireme, plus an additional 20 to 40 marines. We must also point out that Cetius doesn't report the Greek involvement on the same scale, with him saying that 40 Greek ships sailed to Egypt to assist in the revolt, this seeing some 8,000 men committed. Whatever the true numbers were, what is clear, this disaster would have a flow on effect for Athens. The losses suffered were most likely not all Athenian, as it seems league resources were used. Even though the sources refer to Athenians for the most part in this campaign, there are a couple of references to the League. The losses and the damage to Athenian prestige would see what is seen as a crisis for the Athenians developing in the Aegean. The shock of the defeat for all would see some members of the Delian League to sense Athenian weakness. This would see yet further revolts from the League take place. Also, as we will see, the campaigns on the mainland would begin to dry up with Athens now turning its attention to addressing this growing crisis in the Aegean. This disaster on the Nile would turn out to be one of the first serious challenges to Athens' hegemony in the Aegean. It could perhaps be argued, to some degree, that their response to this challenge would see the transition from the Delian League to what is called the Athenian Empire, or at least hasten it. Next episode we'll be heading back to the mainland of Greece, to a point just after the Battle of Tanagra and the same period where the final years of the Egyptian campaign were unfolding. As we saw, Athens had been defeated within Boeotian lands by Sparta, though it was far from decisive. The Athenians returned to Attica without losing much other than men and perhaps a little prestige. Sparta returned back to the Peloponnese unhindered, without having gained any real strategic advantage, while also losing some of their precious manpower. We will look at what would take place in the wake of this battle with both Athens and Sparta reacting to this initial engagement between these two Greek powers of this new phase in Greek history. We will follow further Athenian campaigning in Boeotia and the Peloponnese, with them rebounding after the defeat at Tanagra. However, with the disaster in Egypt, they would be forced to direct their attention away from the mainland and to the crisis that would develop in the Aegean. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting you on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution has truly helped me grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time when we continue the narrative in the series with episode 61, After Tanagra.